Minerals, energy and agriculture, now more than ever, are vital to Australia's clean energy future, economic growth and prosperity. Since 2016, Geoscience Australia has applied science and technology in new ways through the Exploring for the Future program. By gathering, analysing and interpreting data at unprecedented scale and detail, we're building a national picture of Australia's geology and resource potential. So how do we know where to look for potential minerals, energy and groundwater buried deep underground? By analysing rock samples and water percolating up from below, measuring signals from earthquakes and lightning strikes, surveying and mapping with aircraft and seismic trucks. We are looking, listening, monitoring and recording what the Earth is telling us. We look across the country and image hundreds of metres below the surface to create a picture of what lies below our feet, resulting in a new generation of maps and data. Each set of data we acquire is valuable in itself, but when we overlay the data sets together in a way no one has done before, we start to see the full picture and gain a greater understanding of where we can make new discoveries. Australia has become a world leader in the science and innovation behind resource exploration. We're placing data directly into the hands of the people who need it. Governments and local decision makers, investors, explorers and regional communities. Supporting informed decisions that make a real difference to all Australians. We thank the people and communities who collaborate with us to ensure the success of our program. Together, our work is supporting the transition to a sustainable, clean energy future, building tomorrow's industries and stimulating regional economies to ensure the prosperity of future generations. Welcome to the second session of day two of the Exploring for the Future Showcase. My name is Marina Costello. I'm the head of Geoscience Australia's Mineral Systems Branch, and it's my pleasure to be your moderator today. I'd like to begin with acknowledgement of country. Geoscience Australia acknowledges the traditional owners and custodians of country throughout Australia and acknowledges their continuing connection to land, waters and community. We pay our respects to the people, the cultures and elders, past and present. At Geoscience Australia, we acknowledge that our mission to be the trusted source of Earth Sciences information is preceded by tens of thousands of years of knowledge gained by generations of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. I want to acknowledge the traditional custodians of that wisdom and of the lands, waters and skies where we work, live and learn. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders are Australia's original mappers, miners and navigators. This is the heart of our work. And we have so much to learn from their many thousands of years of related knowledge. In today's first session, we heard about the extensive airborne electromagnetic data required by the program across Australia and the latest developments in the Exploring for the Future portal. We also heard about the work to provide better access to geoscience information and to share that knowledge with regional and remote communities. The work we are showcasing was only made possible through extensive co collaboration and we sincerely thank all of our collaborators for their valuable contributions. Our second session today will discuss progress towards national mapping of Australia, including mapping of geology, geochemistry and mineralogy, mineralogy and an overview of early results from our work in the Delamarian Arc. There will be a question and answer session follow, following the presentations and you can ask questions of the presenters by using the Q&A stream at the top of your screen. The speakers are presenting on behalf of large teams, including many scientists, program managers, administrators, coders, database administrators, IT professionals and comms people. If they cannot answer your question, they will be happy to take it on notice via our email eftf at ga.gov.au. 
www.ac.au. Our first speaker is Dr Eloise Beyer, who will discuss the power of national scale geological mapping. Eloise is a geologist with 25 years experience in the public and university sectors. She has a long background in mapping of both mantle and crustal geology, including 15 years working as a geologist with the Northern Territory Geological Survey, where she contributed to regional mapping programs and used geochemistry and geochronology to understand large scale magmatic systems. Joining Geoscience Australia in 2021, Eloise currently leads the National Geological Mapping Team, whose key role it is to produce the fundamental continental scale maps that underpin understanding of Australia's geology and prospectivity. Eloise holds a BSc Honours in Geology from La Trobe University and a PhD in Mantle Petrology from Macquarie University. Thank you, Marina. So hello everyone, it's my pleasure today to present the following update on GEA's progress with national scale mapping of Australia's geology. We have made great progress since last year's EFTF showcase and what I'm about to demonstrate is how far we've come and why we continue to strive for continent-wide coverage. Where I'd like to start is with this following position statement by the Geological Society of America on the value of geologic mapping. And it reads, geologic maps and their subsequent derivative products have immense economic and social value to the nation and its security. And the nation, of course, there being America, but for us, obviously, being Australia. So where this value lies is how geological maps and their derivatives support a myriad of activities from locating and developing mineral, energy and groundwater resources to assessing and protecting sensitive ecosystems to helping prepare for natural hazards, hazards and disasters, and the list goes on. In Australia, where that value truly lies and where we get the most bang for our buck is mapping at national scale, not just at the surface, but more crucially in the subsurface where data are sparse and therefore so is our geological understanding. At GA, we recognise this need for, ge for national maps through firstly collecting pre-competitive data sets, such as the AEM presented by Euston in an earlier session, but then value adding by taking these new and existing data sets and integrating them to build derivative maps and we're doing this in a standardised and consistent way, resulting in even more data coverage and reducing data uncertainty. These maps are being used as important inputs for things such as mineral potential mapping and economic fairways, and also allow us to model surfaces at depth, supporting ac activities such as regional geological frameworks, hydrogen storage and groundwater assessments. What I'd like to do now is to take you through some of our national data sets that we're compiling and show you how they're being integrated to maximise their potential. So where I'd like to start is with the seamless layered national solar geology. This is a high value and high impact project that was initiated under the previous EFTF and will produce five national and seamless chronostratigraphic layers at one to one million scale. Noting that this is a world first and that no other country, let alone one that's a continent, uh, has produced anything like this. Compiled from national and state surface and solar geology maps, this data set provides an unprecedented view of Australia's interpreted subsurface geology and is a foundational data set for building regional geological frameworks such as the Darling Kernamona Delamarian or DCD project, as will be discussed by Yambo later this session, and mineral potential assessments, which will be presented by Ariane in the resource potential session tomorrow. On the left, we can see the first deliverable for this product, which was for North Australia, released in 2020. This image so shows the layered nature of the product from the pre-neoproterozoic at the bottom to the Cenozoic surface geology at the top. We are now working on completing the rest of the comp compilation with the release planned for June 2024. Then on the right, we can see the current status of the data set with Eastern Queensland complete, Western Australia, the DCD, New South Wales and Victoria in production, South Australia and Tasmania in progress, and the last part of Queensland and the Southwest is in planning. So here is a first look at the national product as it currently stands. So I'm just going to take you through the layers with the pre-neoproterozoic, the neoproterozoic, the paleozoic and the mesozoic. And I think you might you will agree this is an impressive looking product. You may notice that there are some seam issues across borders and these are just an artefact of mismatching line work and symbology between the differing data sets. And this will be rectified in the single national compilation when it's released next year. I would now like to move on to another national layer data set, but this time for a very specific class of rocks, alkaline igneous rocks. Alkaline igneous rocks are a relatively rare class of igneous rocks worldwide, and they're diverse with a complicated classification and nomenclature. In the simplest sense, these rocks are defined as those with alkalis, so sodium and potassium, in excess of either aluminium and or silica. 
and they're largely considered as mantle derived. So why an Australian atlas of these rocks? Well, first and foremost, alkaline rocks are recognised as a significant source of critical minerals, including rare earth minerals, niobium, tantalum, zirconium, hafnium and copper. And therefore, knowing where they are and their prospectivity for their commodities directly supports Australia's commitment to a net zero future. The problem, however, is that these rocks are vol volumetrically minor in Australia, and that can therefore be an issue for any mineral prospectivity assessments as some important host units may not be fully captured in the one to one million solid geology, which generally underpins mineral potential mapping. So to reduce the risk that some of these prospective units may be misrepresented or incorrectly weighted in mineral potential assessments, the atlas was created. And I'd like to point out again that like the solid geology maps, this is a world first. So what is the atlas? So like the solid geology, it's a layered product and it consists of a GIS data set and a, an accompanying record for five time periods, which we can see here. So starting with the Archean, and um, the GIS in the record has been released, the Proterozoic, which is due for release um, in September, the Paleozoic, which is also out, the Mesozoic, which is also released, and the Cenozoic. So for each of these layers, we capture key information for every individual alkaline rock unit, including stratigraphic name, which is consistent with the Australian Stratigraphic Units database, lithologies, age, emplacement type, and presence of mantles, xenoliths, and diamonds, and more. We have also defined informal alkaline provinces for each layer, grouping units of similar age and composition. In terms of application, one example I can give you is the use of the subset of the atlas used for carbonatite-related rare earth mineral potential mapping, which Ariane will present tomorrow. And in this case, carbonatites and a variety of related and associated alkaline lithologies were used as the input data. And I encourage you to watch Ariane's talk to see the resultant maps and implications for rare earth prospectivity. And once, this lay once the last layer, being the Proterozoic, is released, we're not done with alkaline rocks. We'll then be moving on to the next stage of the project, which will be to compile the geochemical data, as this was a recognised gap when we were doing the compilation that we just don't have geochemical information for all the rocks. Um, and this is obviously going to be very helpful for better understanding um, their composition and prospectivity. So we've started some preliminary work with collaborate, uh, through a collaboration with the Geological Survey of New South Wales. And this is just showing the um, compilation as a whole. I would now like to move on to our work in cover mapping and how we determine depth estimates to map geological surfaces under cover. And I'd like to begin with the um, Airborne Electromagnetic or AEM data set. In the first session, we heard from Eusen about uh, GA's AEM acquisition program. And I'd like to just again draw your attention to the status of the national coverage in this slide. As has been outlined, AEM model data is a useful tool for mapping geology undercover and is effective down to a depth of approximately 400 metres, allowing us to map in the near to shallow surface. What I'm going to show in the next few slides focuses on the value of these model data and how we use it in our interpretive maps to better map and understand the subsurface. I'm going to start first with a national conductivity map and then we're going to focus in on an interpretation project in the southern part of the Eastern Resources Corridor, uh, which is just shown here. So now I'm moving on to the national conductivity grids using machine learning. So one thing you'll have noticed about the AEM sections is the spacing in between the flight lines. So while we have vertical conductivity structure, we have no information laterally between the lines. And while it's not practical to fill in the gaps using the traditional method of flying airborne EM, there is another way, and that is through machine learning to build conductivity models. Last year, we presented on the published conductivity model for Northern Australia, and I'm happy to let you know that we have now completed and released the national conductivity model. Um, and the link is there on the slide. In these models, machine learning has been used to generate predictive high resolution conductivity maps to interpolate between flight lines. These models aim to establish predictive relationships between AEM conductivity measurements and a suite of national environmental and geological covariates, including terrain derivatives, gamma ray radiometric data, geological maps, climate derived surfaces and satellite imagery. On the left, we can see the training sites model where the points in yellow are the training sets with around 460,000 observations used. The points in purple are the sample testing sites with a reported out of sample R squared of 0.75, which indicates that the model conductivities are seemingly consistent with the geological, regolith, geomorphological and climate processes in the study area. And then on the right, we can see the conductivity model for the zero to four metre in depth interval. The high conductivity is in the oranges and reds, and this nicely delineates the paleo channels in the map model. And the more resistive areas are shown in dark blue and purple. 
These models provide a novel complementary methodology to gridding and interpolating from AEM conductivity alone and have the potential to be used in geological mapping, mineral exploration and natural resource management, specifically in assisting with managing salinity in farming landscapes and groundwater studies. So now I'm going from the national scale down to focus on um, AEM interpretation in the southern part of the Eastern Resources Corridor. So preliminary work on this interpretation was presented at last year's showcase. Um, and I'm happy to say that the interpretation package is now being completed and released through ECAT and can also be visualised in 3D in GA's data discovery portal. The aim of this study was to interpret the AEM conductivity sections in this part of the ERC, which we can see here on the slide, um, to develop a regional understanding of the near surface stratigraphy and structural architecture. So to ensure that the interpretations took into account the local geological features, the conductivity sections were integrated and interpreted with other geological and geophysical data sets such as boreholes, potential field data, surface and solar geology maps and seismic interpretation. In this slide we can see the top and within the Cenozoic layer of the Murray Basin and this allows us to be able to map hydrostratigraphic units within the basin supporting agriculture, groundwater and environmental management and also activities such as mining, as there are some units in the basin that are prospective for minerals, including clay-hosted rare earths. We can also strip off the Cenozoic, as we can see in this next slide, and see what lies beneath, allowing us to determine cover thickness, which is useful for many reasons. It tells us about depth to prospective basement, for instance, in the Kernamona Craton, which hosts world-class lead zinc deposits. Being able to map undercover expands the potential search space for mineral deposits and reduces exploration risk. Likewise, for the Delamarian origin um, and its prospective parts, such as in the Stavely stall zones, the Loch Lily Cars and Coonaberry Belts. Also in this region, cover thickness modelling was also used to provide support for stratigraphic drill hole targeting, such as that recently undertaken as part of the Delamarian Margins New South Wales National Drilling Initiative campaign, which was in a collaboration between GA's EFTF program, the MINAC CRC National Drilling Initiative and the Geological Survey of New South Wales. And if you would like to get your hands on this data set, um, here is the link here. The other value in this interpretation is it also allows us to calculate depth estimates to geological boundaries with approximately 170,000 depth estimate points determined for this part of the ERC, which leads me on to the next slide, and that's the estimates of geological and geophysical services database. So the EGS database is a national repository for standardised depth estimate points. These depth estimates are derived from a variety of sources, including AEM inversions, boreholes, and depths to magnetic tops, and collectively allow, enable us to robustly map the subsurface by creating national surfaces at major chronostrophic boundaries. I'm now gonna take you through the three key data sets. So the first here is depth to magnetic tops. This is, as, this is the data that currently exists and is available in the data discovery portal. Um, so it includes data from targeted magnetic inversion modelling, NORDI order mag points and magnetic spectral points. However, through a collaboration with CSIRO, we now have a whole new batch of TMIM depth estimates which are coming soon in the Officer Basin, North East Queensland, the Eastern Resources Corridor and also in Tasmania. So this was a major collaboration with, with CSIRO and these points will be, in the, will be in the portal by the end of the year. In terms of the boreholes, this um, map here we can see in the pale colour is the currently available points in the portal and in dark pink we have all the new boreholes that will be released in December. Um, we're also hoping to improve coverage by using boreholes recent re recently released in the Australian Borehole Stratigraphic Units compilation. We'd like to thank Mineral Resources Tasmania for their help and attribution of the Tasmanian boreholes. In terms of depths determined from AEM interpretation, this is the current status of the availability of those depth points in the portal. Talking of the portal, this is what the data looks like in the portal. Uh, on the left hand side, this is showing depths below ground level and on the right is chronostratigraphic attribution for the depth estimate. So this is just a couple of ways in which you can view the eggs data in the portal. Moving on to my next slide, so that we've these eggs data sets have been integrated with solid geology maps and also with AEM inter interpretation and assisted with the development of layered surface cover models in two areas of interest. So I'd now like to introduce you to our layered cover modelling and the LOOP Geoscience Project, which is led by Monash University and initiated by Geoscience Australia and funded by Australian Territory, State and Federal Geological Surveys, the Australian Research Council and MINEC CRC. LOOP is an open source 3D geological modelling platform which aims to develop technologies to mitigate 3D geological risk, risk in both exploration and resource management. 
At GA, we've been collaborating with Monash to use Loop to harness its interpolation capabilities to build layer surface cover models in two main areas of interest, with the North Australia model on the left, recently updated with revised AEM interpretation, and the Darling Kernamona Delamaria model there on the right being the current focus under the EFTF. These models will provide a geometric basis for resource assessment in these regions, expanding the search space and reducing exploration risk. So I'd now like to move on to a different way of mapping, and this is in the fourth dimension, time. So isotopic and age data sets and their derivatives are important tools for constraining the timing of major events in a region's geological history, i.e. magmatism, metamorphism, tectonism and mineralisation. At GA, these data are captured in the Isotopic Atlas, a national compilation of data from five isotopic systems, which we can see there on the left-hand side. These data sets unlock the collective value of several decades of geochronological and isotopic studies conducted across Australia, with each data set containing sufficient geog geographic coverage to allow gridding of the data at continental or semi-continental scale. So GA has released two state compilations under the EFTF, Victoria in 2021, and Tasmania uh, just in December last year. And these compilations could not be done without cooperation from our state part partners with Mineral Resources Tasmania supplying the bulk of the data for the Tasmanian compilation. As for the other states, uh, South Australia and New South Wales are currently being compiled. So stay tuned for those releases in the coming months. Another recent update is to the Atlas is the Igneous Crystallisation Age Grid. And this was released on the portal in June this year with more comprehensive coverage and then better resolution in states such as Victoria and Tasmania. Also, and without giving too much away, one interesting use of hafnium and oxygen isotopic maps is coming up in Yambo's talk later this session, so stay tuned for that. So now I'd just like to finish with a look at the new national 3D major crustal boundaries of Australia map. This map illustrates the power of integrating national data sets to build a 3D model of Australia's gross structure and architecture. So here is the 2023 model, shown with constraining seismic data sets. Most changes and updates of the model are in Northern Australia, in and around the margin of the North Australia Craton, an area that has seen major data acquisition since the inception of the EFTF program. The Kidson Seismic Survey has provided new constraints on the architecture of the Pilbara margin, Rudal province and Patterson origin. Whereas major data acquisition campaigns in the Northern Territory, including deep seismic, magnetotellurics, passive seismic and isotopic geochemistry have allowed us to map several new major crustal boundaries in the central part of the North Australian Craton. One of them, the Gulunguru Fault, is associated with the East Tennant and Tennant Creek districts. We're finishing the model here in northeastern Queensland, looking at the complex crustal architecture of the Mount Isa, Isa province and northwest Queensland. The model is close to final and will be released before the end of the year. And stay tuned for more good stuff coming in the next 12 months. Thank you. Thank you, Eloise. So many exciting new geological mapping products coming out now and in the near future. It will significantly advance our understanding of subsurface geology, including cover. It's really impressive. So just a reminder, do add your questions in the Q&A panel at the top of your screen and include the name of the presenter you'd like to ask the question to, and we'll get these into the Q&A session that starts later on. Our next speaker is Dr. Patrice de Caritat who will present on new surface mineralogical and geochemical maps of Australia. Patrice has a licentiate of science and a PhD in geology. He has studied and worked in Belgium, Australia, Canada and Norway, with a focus on sediment, regolith and groundwater geochemistry. Of particular interest to him are the nature and the origin of geochemical patterns at the regional to continental scales, the effects of superficial processes on regolith and groundwater composition, the elemental and isotopic fingerprinting of mineralisation and contamination, and modelling and prediction of geochemical patterns and processes. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, so we've heard some uh, exciting talks about uh, geology and geophysics, and today I'm going to change uh, direction a little bit and talk to you about surface mineralogical and geochemical maps of Australia. We have some new exciting products coming out of the National Database of Archive Sample Projects, and I'll give you some highlights. That project is essentially code for doing exciting stuff with samples that we already have in our archives. So why focus on mineralogy and geochemistry? Well, essentially mineral deposits are geochemical anomalies. And anomalies cannot be defined if we don't understand the background. And it extends beyond miner mineral exploration. If, you, if you're doing pollution remediation or you're trying to rehabilitate a mine, you need to understand how your background in the area 
what it is and how it varies. So we need quantitative data about the values and the distribution of elements at the surface and their hosting minerals, as well as uh, need, we need to quantify some uncertainties. So I would, I would posit that knowing geochemistry without, without knowing mineralogy is nothing, because mineralogy controls element avail availability, dispersion, detectability, persistence, and eventually metallurgy. And in addition to all these applications, defining robust background data bolsters our social license to operate. So the talk today is going to essentially review the two archives that, that we're going to uh, exploit, NGSA and legacy samples from uh, all the surveys. And I'm going to give highlights, a rapid fire a series of slides that highlight seven projects. So the regolith mineralogy map, the geochemical grids of Australia, the reanalysis of legacy stream sediment samples, the strontium isotope map, the lead isotope maps, and the Samarium neodymium isotope map. And the last one I'm going to spend a little bit more time on is the heavy mineral map of Australia. Then we're going to look at the products that are coming or are already out and some conclusions. And I'd like to take a minute to thank all my collaborators and you've shown here a, a network of all the people I work with from various organizations. I'll just briefly mention Brent McInnes, Phil Main, Alex Walker, David Champion, Shandan Diesem, Ulrike Troich, Evgeny Bastrakov, Anthony Deceto and John Wilford. So on to the two archives that we, have, that we have mined. The first one is the NGSA, the National Geochemical Survey of Australia. This project about 10 years ago sampled uh, approximately 80% of Australia by taking floodplain sediment samples near the outlet of very large catchments. We sampled two depths, separated the uh, samples in, th in three grain size fractions and ended up to three chemical analyses. So they're very well uh, characterized geochemically and now we're adding some new data to these. And the other uh, set of archives is uh, approximately 50 years of uh, geochemical surveys that are held at uh, GA and its previous organizations. That this represents about 9,000 samples. So the first uh, of the, of the sub-project is a regolith mineralogy map of Australia. So we have uh, up to now analyzed about 350 samples including uh, in the DCD area here and then this uh, transcontinental uh, transect uh, that goes from South Australia to the Gulf of Carpentaria. So knowing the mineralogy of the uh, sediments is very important to understand their evolution, their protolith, their weathering, and essentially uh, putting a context to the geology and the geophysics that we have about these areas. So in this project, we analyzed both bulk XRD and clay fraction XRD and did some quantitative analyses. Uh, the map on the, on the left shows uh, the, the, the most important uh, mafic minerals or their distributions as pie, chart, pie charts in this uh, second project. And the map on, the, on your right shows the, uh, the four main carbonate phases uh, in the project. And interestingly, we found a very robust uh, relationship between SiO2 and quartz uh, in this transcontinental con uh, transect, which would, uh, which would allow us to uh, calculate predictively quartz concentrations from all the data we have for SiO2. The second project is producing high resolution uh, geochemical grids of Australia, similar to the coverages we have for geophysics, such as uh, uh, TMI or radiometrics, but for geochemistry. So this is essentially done by machine learning using tens of thousands of geochemical surface data points and extrapolating them using covariates, up to 50 covariates. And so you have various maps here, SiO2, uh, potassium, uh, iron, and calcium. And so these are uh, going to come out uh, later this year. The reanalysis of the 9,000 stream sediment legacy samples uh, produced uh, not only better data with up-to-date uh, technologies, but also more complete data sets. For example, we have a lot more elements, including the rare earth elements and things like cobalt, etc., that weren't necessarily in the original assay assays. Uh, the map on the left is a, is a map of zinc distribution in the, in the Georgetown region, and the two maps on the right are the heavy and the light rare element distribution in the uh, Cape York region. Now on to the isotopes. We produced in two different projects uh, the strontium isotope or isoscapes of uh, two various parts of Australia, and these are available as, as two publications and also uh, as one download point in the, uh, in the portal. And essentially what we were able to show was a huge variation in strontium isotopes across the continent from 0.70 to more than one. Um, and we were able to uh, provide some preliminary interpretations in terms of the origin of the sediments, the modes of transports, fluvial versus aeolian, and the types of rocks, the ages of rocks in the, in the catchments. 
So this was done on approximately 450 samples. The regolith let ice escape of Australia is a product that is uh, going to be released very shortly. It's preliminary at this stage, uh, but we have essentially uh, analyzed all the samples from the NGSA and, and uh, we are releasing five as, uh, lead isotope ratios and this is a map of lead 206, 204. Uh, I haven't shown the scale because this is coming out uh, from a thesis uh, at the University of Melbourne very, very shortly, but essentially it shows you the, the scope of the work and the kind of variations and uh, geochemical patterns that were found. And the last of the isotopic maps is the neodymium map. Uh, so uh, this uh, map on your left here shows you the bedrock-based uh, neodymium map of Australia on which we have overlain the NGSA samples that we selected. So you can see three transects. And the map on the right is essentially reinterpreting the surface maps so the, the raster and the interpol interpolation be, uh, behind the points with all the rocks and all the new uh, NGSA samples. And you can see there has been some changes in patterns and values. Uh, and now on to the uh, project I will spend a little bit more time on, that is the heavy mineral map of Australia, HMMA. So heavy minerals are uh, known and well used uh, exploration technique, uh, especially overseas, but not so much in Australia. Uh, they have various advantages in for example, that they can persist quite long in the weathering cycle and therefore can leave us with the diagnostic tool to recognize the or origin of the formation of the rocks from which they come. And they have been used successfully in diamond, rare earth elements, base metals, precious metals, etc. overseas. So the, the vision of the HMMA project was essentially, essentially to use all the NGSA samples and uh, extract heavy minerals from them and produce a background map of the heavy mineral distribution across Australia. We did a pilot project on 10 samples, and then we expanded the project to the national scope, uh, national scope uh, working with the John DeLater Center at Curtin. We focused on the 75 to 430 micron fraction to avoid the uh, aeolian material. We separated the heavy minerals by dense liquids, and we mounted them on these epoxy packs that you can see. They have a, a, on the back of them, they have a QR code, and we uh, analyzed them using an instrument called the TEMA, and up to tens of 10,000 or more grains were analyzed per amount. The uh, QR code at the back of each puck will give you some, essentially immediately give you some metadata about the site, including a map of where it comes from. And for this project, the HMMA project, uh, as, as the project was uh, moving along, we had two partial releases uh, in 2022, one for the uh, darling Conamona de la Marion region in southeastern Australia, and one for the, uh, the Barclay Isa Georgetown area in, in northeastern Australia. Both of these had about 200 samples in them and covered about 1 million square kilometers. Uh, in the HMMA, we also developed a tool to allow us to dig uh, efficiently and rapidly into this huge data set, millions of data points, uh, and that's called the mineral network analysis. And essentially what it does is it allows you to filter your mineralogical data, for example, by element of interest. It shows a network in which you can see the nodes, which are the individual minerals. The size of the node represents how abundant they are, or how common they are in the, sample, in the sample set. The color is the type of mineral, whether it's an oxide, a silicate, or a sulfide, or whatever. And the links between each mineral uh, represent uh, how often they uh, co-occur in the same sample. And uh, this QR code gets you straight to our MNA app, which is open, open access to the public. So what have our impacts to date uh, been for the HMMA? So we had a partial release of the DCD in August, uh, July last year. And uh, after that release, a uh, former BHP exploration geologist was interviewed and said that it was great to see a systematic regional or continental scale heavy mineral sampling of the drainage sediments undertaken by GA and Curtin. And the database of heavy minerals uh, could indeed hold hints to mineralization as yet unrecognized, especially under shallow cover. And also a junior uh, zinc, uh, copper, nickel exploration picked up some ground after seeing this release uh, when they saw 25 grain counts of garnite uh, well off the uh, Kernamona block near Adelaide. And uh, this was quite an anomalous value and they picked up some ground there for exploration. So what have we released and what, uh, what is coming up in the, next, in the future? Uh, I'll go through this while you can see a map that represents all the different analyses that were undertaken on the NGSA samples. So for the regolith mineralogy map of Australia, we have two published studies, uh, one in southeastern Australia, one that is a north-south transect. They will be combined and uploaded to the portal shortly, and the potential is to analyze the rest of the NGSA samples. For the geochemical grids of Australia, we are producing and releasing this year geochemical grids for 10 major oxides, covering the whole country, and potentially trace elements could follow. 
the reanalysis of legacy samples is essentially completed and released for all the samples that we had in-house. The strontium isotope map of Australia, also we had two published studies and we're now looking at uh, bioavailable as, as opposed to total strontium to see if that correlates and it could be of interest to other uh, st stakeholders. And there is of course also the potential there to analyze the rest of the NGSA samples. The regularly slid ice escape of Australia is coming out as two papers later this year and the data will be uploaded to the portal and the neodymium uh, pretty much the same. We are preparing a report and a release for later this year. The heavy mineral map of Australia, you can see a preview of the national scale maps here that will come up. So the two, uh, the pilot project has been published, the two partial data sets have been published and this complete uh, atlas and uh, data set are, are coming up later this year, probably in October. So watch this space, this is a pipeline of data that's coming straight at you. So in conclusion, uh, the National Database of Archive Samples project has acquired new significant mineralogical and geochemical data across Australia. It has relied on NGSA and other archive samples to value add to the original studies. It has been a cost effective and efficient uh, fieldwork model that allowed us access to remote, potentially now developed or inaccessible areas. Some of the products are national in scope and others are regional and many have the potential for expansion. We are also uh, creating a new mineral mineralogy database for Geostance Australia that will be designed and populated. Uh, the heavy mineral project uh, combines a sample, uh, national sample archive with a mature exploration strategy and state-of-the-art analytical technologies. It's underpinned by a pilot project that fine-tuned the methods and it will deliver the world's first continental scale public domain heavy mineral data set and atlas. The collection of uh, the polished mounds, uh, mounds will be a geoscientific asset in perpetuity for future mineral analyses and we also designed the bespoke mineral network analysis tool to allow us to efficiently explore this data rich asset. We had two partial data releases and the national data release is coming up and we welcome any feedback that will allow us to make our releases uh, more uh, usable by our stakeholders. So here are my acknowledgements and with that I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Patrice. That certainly is a pipeline of new geochemical and mineralogical data sets coming out to characterise the surface. It's pretty impressive. Our next speaker in this session is Dr Babak Harani, who will present on imaging Australia's lithospheric architecture. Babak holds a Bachelor of Science in Pure Maths, a Master of Science in Geophysics, and a PhD in Seismic Imaging, and has worked at ANU as a researcher for five years before he joined Geoscience Australia. He has studied and worked in Kurdistan, Denmark, Germany, Switzerland, and of course, Australia. Currently, Babak focuses on developing an automated and scalable workflow for ambient noise tomography. He also contributes to various passive seismic imaging techniques, such as body wave tomography, receiver functions, and full wave tomography. Babak is involved in designing, deploying, and maintaining OzArray, the largest ever passive seismic deploy covering the entire Australian continent. In this talk, I will discuss seismic imaging of the lithosphere in Australia using passive seismic techniques and argue why this technique fills in the gap in the knowledge between seismic and potential field data. I will start by discussing how and where this technique fits in our current state of knowledge about the Australian lithosphere and then show you results from EFTF OSARAY data. Um, different geophysical, ge geological and geochemical data tell us different properties of the Earth, like looking at an image with different lenses. GA has a history of collecting baseline pre-competitive data for the Australian continent. I brought a few examples here, solid geology, surface geology, geochemistry and geophysical data. To make a case for a new pre-competitive data, I would like to take you on a quick tour of geophysical data that you might be used to in your day-to-day -day geoscience analysis. And I would like to highlight a key difference, a gap in the knowledge between the information that seismic techniques using active sources are generating with our geophysical data and models. And then I introduce how passive seismic data and models can fill in this gap. Um, I'll start the tour by radiometric map of Australia. Um, this radiometric map shows the concentration of radio elements. Next up, 
is the magnetic map of Australia. Both radiometric and magnetic map um, should provide a coverage over the continent and their resolution and coverage keeps improving over time. Next up is the AEM, which is a technique that can measure variations in the conductivity of the ground to a depth of several hundred meters. So what we obtain is actually a 3D model. Dr. Yusin Lee Cooper talked about the Oz AEM earlier today. Next model is the Oz LAMP or Australian Lithospheric Architecture Magnetotelluric Project here at GA, which is a collaborative national survey that acquires long period magnetotelluric data at approximately 3,000 sites across the Australian continent. The map shows the status of data coverage and the model shows a depth slice through the 3D model in the north of Australia. Um, the final potential field that I'm going to briefly touch upon is the gravity map of Australia. I will come back to this gravity map when I compare my results with this. And it's showing you the sh variation in the density, which is obtained from over 1,000 surveys for 67 years. Um, the level of coverage in these models are truly impressive. Now, this is the last um, data to end the tour with, uh, which is the active seismic. So active seismic data are provided to us um, along seismic lines. So we get a very high resolution image, on, but only along a line. And if, if we compare the last two data sets that I brought here, um, we can clearly see a gap. On the left, the gravity and other potential field data, and they provide a, either 2D coverage or a 3D coverage of the entire continent. But the active seismic lines, due to logistics, they only provide high resolution, but along a line information, as you can see on this map. So there is a gap in the knowledge between the seismic velocities on one hand and the potential field on the other hand. And this is where passive seismic imaging can come in to fill in the gap. Um, so what is passive seismic? This is a schematic view um, of uh, layers within the Earth, different passive seismic techniques, ambient noise tomography that I will talk about today. It has been used extensively in academia to image the crust. Receiver function has been used to dim image the layers uh, within the uh, lithosphere and surface wave tomography, um, which has, be has been used to image the lithospheric structure. Today, I will be only talking about ambient noise tomography and how we use ambient noise tomography to extract dispersive properties of surface wave. Surface waves travel within at the shallow layers of the Earth. And by shallow, I mean the top 500, 600 kilometer. Um, the lower frequencies, they're traveling deep. And the higher fre frequencies, they're traveling at shallower layers. Because the Earth structure changes with depth and the seismic velocities increase with depth, the lower frequencies are traveling faster than, than the higher frequencies. So I, to show you an example of this, the theory of ambient noise tomography tells us if we cross-correlate data between two seismic stations, as you can see here, I picked up two examples, from our permanent network. And if you cross-correlate chunks of data for how many uh, hours of data that you have, which is shown on the y-axis and the x-axis, which is the time, you would expect a signal to arise between these two. Where it's where you, see, where you expect to see surface wave. But I'm pretty sure that you all would say there's nothing in this. It actually looks like TV static. Um, but, and every individual would actually look like that. There's no signal in it. But if we stack all of these up, a surface wave signal emerges. To take, I take this surface wave signal and I filter it at different frequencies. At lower frequencies, you can see that the, um, the seismic waves arrive earlier than the higher frequencies. So this is what we call the dispersive properties of surface waves. Different frequencies travel at different depth. That's why some of them arrive early, which these are deep, and some of them arrive late. Those are the shallow ones. And so we can relate these to different layers within the Earth. The deep ones are convecting mantle and the shallower ones are the sedimentary layers. So using an array of seismometer, we can derive a surface wave map, a sort of an, an, an image which tells us this variation in seismic velocity. But this requires measurements of dispersive properties between every station pair in our array. And this is a labor intensive manually job that usually uh, it's done in academia. But I have developed a uh, scalable and streamlined approach to estimate dispersion properties of the surface wave 
and I'll show you results of such uh, work for ambient noise tomography um, for other way network in Northern Territory, which I will come back to. But these surface wave maps are now in, in the frequency domain. So we need to convert these to um, depth. And we do this at every pixel in, this, in these images. So we basically create a 1D velocity model for every pixel in these images. And that would be our 3D velocity model. I'll move on to, the, uh, to show you some results from uh, uh, Azure Network, which is deployed in Northern Territory in Queensland. This was done during 2017 and 2021. Uh, and I will be showing, I will be comparing my results with some pre-existing um, uh, interpretation and models. Gravity at the top, RC base, which tells us the depth to the basement, and outline and basin outlines. Um, this is the map of uh, uh, ambient noise tomography at 2.5 seconds, which you can think of it as roughly the top two kilometer of the crust. Um, I will be comparing features in this image with what we know about the uh, shallow structure. Um, the first thing that pops out is this ma massive low velocity anomaly at the south of the model, which we know it coincides with the Amadeus Basin, which we have seen this a low gravity anomaly. Uh, it's been imaged in the RC base with a, a very deep sediment, a sedimentary basin down to 10 kilometer, and the outline, as you can see, is shown there. But what's more interesting is this tiny little low velocity anomaly north of Amadeus Basin, and this is called the Nalia Basin. It's been known for many years. This is a cross section from 1976. I think this was um, um, one of the first um, seismic lines that GA deployed, and they have imaged this, uh, this basin. It's not as deep and as uh, big as the Amadeus Basin, but I was personally surprised that such a small scale feature can be imaged using ambient noise tomography. So now with, the, with these two validation points, these were my validation points, because remember this was a automatic method. I did not pick any of those dispersion curves. So I need to validate my model against pre-existing knowledge. Now I'll move on to this area um, where we have a lot of low velocity anomalies and I will compare with RC base and gravity data. The most prominent feature in this model is this low velocity anomaly in the center around the border between Northern Territory and Queensland. And this was discovered to be the Carrara subbasin um, during phase one of the EFDF project. Um, the outline of this um, subbasin is shown on the map and also on the gravity and also on the RC base. And I would like to show you a seismic line. And this is an active seismic line that is running through the basin. And um, I will extract seismic velocities from my ambient noise tomography. And, it, and I will superimpose it on a depth migra migrated image of the active seismic line for a comparison, for a visual comparison. And this is the ambient noise tomography result on top of the active seismic line. And we see a great correlation between the low, extreme low velocity anomalies and the major features, major layers that has been interpreted by the active seismics. Um, so this to me is a great result. It's another validation that this method nicely work, provides information about seismic velocities, not just on a map with variation, but also with depth. Um, I should notice, I should make a point here that um, the, the image at the top shows um, a different color bar. So, so slow is red, high velocities, relatively higher velocities are um, blue. But here, because the seismic velocities change a lot with depth, I've extended the color bar. So, the high, so we go from red and then 3.5, which is mid velocities, and then higher velocity, which is more about 4.5. Um, so, I'll show you one more um, uh, uh, image like this where I superimpose ambient noise tomography on top of um, active seismic lines. So the f at first when uh, Carrara Basin was discovered, um, th we, they realized that it's uh, coinciding with this low gravity anomaly, but there is another low gravity anomaly right next to it. So the question was, is this also a, a basin? Well. Um, from the active seismic lines, it was interpreted that, that no, there's no basin over here. This is bedrock material. So the Carrara basin actually ends around here. And this is exactly what we also see 
from our uh, ambient noise tomography. Towards east, we see we, where we are in the Carrara subbasin, we see low velocity anomalies, but in the middle, where we are at this at the second low gravity anomaly, we only see bedrock material. Remember, this is a 3D model, so we are not bounded by any active seismic line, so we can actually look at other cross-sections. So I brought three cross-sections here. First one is over here. This is a targeted, new targeted area with this low velocity anomaly. Um, our basin systems group uh, had a active seismic line over here, but they couldn't go further down due to logistics. But this uh, 3D velocity model provides coverage for us so that we can go through it. Um, so the first cross section, uh, the background velocities, uh, seismic velocities, and I superimpose a tracked um, RC base and depth to the basement on top of this, which you see with that line. So clearly we have a low velocity anomaly, which is not fully represented in the RC base, and it goes down to 2.5 to 3 kilometer. It's not as strong as the Carrara subbasin. It could be a, a, a thin sedimentary layer. I go slightly right and thin layer is still there. And if I go further right, that thin layer persistently is there. So I, I hope I've convinced you with the uh, potentials of the ambient noise tomography for looking at the shallow crustal structure. But this model is a 3D model that goes down to 80 kilometer depth. So, um, so next, next up, I will sh be showing you two cross sections on uh, my favorite part of the model, which is over this low and high gravity anomalies. These are, um, th these are world famous gravity anomalies um, that we have here in Northern Territory. W the first cross section, uh, which goes through the low gravity anomaly shows here on top, clearly represents the uh, Amadeus Basin. We can make a comparison between low velocity anomalies and the depth from our sea base. It's not a one-to-one -one comparison, but it's there. And then basement, basement uh, velocities, lower crust, and then we, we cross the Moho and we go into the mantle. Uh, if I go north, the cross section CD, which goes through the high gravity anomaly, now we don't see any basins. Uh, the basement velocities uh, are at the, uh, near the surface. This, low, this high velocity lower crust is now near the surface, and we have a complicated image of Moho and the mantle. So, I hope by these two examples, I've shown the potential of ambient noise tomography and what it can do to image the lithospheric structure for us. Next, uh, to, um, f uh, to show you what, what we are doing at the moment, at the second stage of the EFTF. This is the current state of deployments in Australia, uh, broadband um, uh, three component uh, temporary stations plus our permanent stations here run by GA and Australian seismometers in schools in red. So you can clearly see that there, there are large areas where there have never been any deployment. There are no stations. Our new network is providing a coverage through all of this. And uh, what I've shown you previously was a detailed um, the image that shows the full potential of ambient noise tomography. With this deployment, we will ensure a continental scale image and new pre-competitive data that could be used by geoscientists. Now, I would like to touch upon some of the challenges that we have in the ambient noise tomography. Uh, with such a large uh, continental scale deployments, a lot of these points, uh, can, uh, uh, there's no easy access to them. So our contractors are using helicopters. Uh, our setups would look something like that. It, this is a non-invasive deployment where the station is just sitting underneath a solar panel quietly recording for a year. And you would think that, well, no one would notice that. Well, when we go out to uh, uh, service our stations, um, our stations, for some reason, they attract a lot of attention from the wildlife. So it's not just the seismologists that are interested in these. Um, this, this is a GPS cable chewed by a cow, and I think a cow is sat on the uh, whole station in this case. So um, uh, to wrap up, ambient noise tomography is an easy to deploy, non-invasive operation, is cheap to operate and maintain and it provides 3D volumetric images of the crust. Um, we here at GA developed a uh, scalable and streamlined approach to seismic tomography. And with this new network, we will provide an Australia-wide variation in the seismic velocity. I would like to end by acknowledging our uh, state survey partners and academic partners. Thank you. Thank you, Babak.
the correlation between the ambient noise tomography model and the map basins in the gravity and active seismic data is impressive. I can't wait to see the results from the full National Oz Array in due course. We'll wait for that one. Now our final speaker for this session is Dr Yambo Cheng, who will, who will present on the metallogenic potential of the Delamerian margin. Yambo is currently leading the mineral potential assessment module of the Delamerian Kunamona Dal Darling project under the Exploring for the Future program. Before joining Geoscience Australia, Yambo was a researcher in economic geology at the Geological Survey of Norway between 2019 and 2022 and was involved in projects on volcanic hosted massive sulphide, porphyry and magnetic nickel, copper and platinum group element systems in Norway. As a postdoctoral researcher at the Economic Geology Research Centre at James Cook University, Yangbo worked on tin and tungsten mineral systems in northeast Queensland during 2014 to 2017, and magma fertility and the Mary Kathleen iron oxide copper gold belt during 2018 and 19. Yambo temporarily joined the mining industry in 2018 as an exploration geologist on intrusion related gold deposits in Queensland. Yangbo was awarded his PhD in economic geology from James Cook University in 2013. Thank you, Marina. Welcome to the last talk of the session. Following the three earlier speakers on national scale study, studies, in the next, I'm going to show a regional study. You will find lots of connections between my talk and the other talks today. The aim of our talks is the same, to build Australia's resource wealth. This talk is a part of the DCD project, which is one of the three deep dive projects under the EFTF program. We focus on the Delamari, Kernamana, and Darling River areas and aim to review the resource potential for minerals, groundwater, and natural hydrogen storage in the project area. My talk is about the metallogenic potential of the Dalamari margin, and my colleague Sarah will talk about groundwater in the Upper Darling Plain tomorrow. So why do we want to study the DCD area? We want to understand the geology because there may be potential for both groundwater and mineral resources, including copper. As discussed by Andrew yesterday, copper is at the heart of energy transition and the pathway to net zero. There are snips of copper in DCD project area. A holistic regional study will provide fundamental and foundational geoscience information to help explorers make discoveries. Our project stands on the shoulders of giants. Many pioneers have invested lots of time and resources to understand the geology and the mineral potential within our project area over the past decades and they have generated many brilliant ideas and understandings. Most of the previous studies focus on local areas instead of the whole picture of the Delamarine margin. On the other hand, most of the Delamarine terrain is undercover, which means investigating the nature and architecture of Delamarine arc is not straightforward, and the big picture of the regional mineral potential is unclear. Therefore, it is important to conduct a comprehensive study on the whole Delamarine margin. There are three key, quest key science questions to answer. What's the extent and the nature and the variability of the Delamarine arc? What is the mineral potential in Delamarine margin? And what are the best ways to target exploration and cover? Let's look at the geology of the Delamarine margin from the time-sliced solid geological maps of the region, from New Proto Rock, Cambrian, Ordovician to Silurian and different tectonic settings have been proposed. There are multiple known mineral systems with different ages. It is a covered terrain. To test the solid geology and assess regional mineral potential, we use AEM, seismic, MT method to unravel the cover of basement and crustal architecture in Delamarine. We also value legacy drill holes for understanding regional geology and mineral potentials. No one has systematically studied the legacy drill hole samples of the Delamarine before. So this project is the first comprehensive study using the legacy drill core samples to look into the regional mineral potential through mineral system-based approach. In the next, I'm going to show our preliminary results. The AEM geophysics have been proved effective in providing key information on how deep are these solid geology and the thickness of the cover. As mentioned by my colleague Yusin on National AEM survey this morning, 
and Eloise on national geological mapping this afternoon. AEM surveys have been completed in the DCD project area. Data has been released. AEM can reflect the undercover geology up to 400 to 500 meters steps which are useful to review the trends in regulus, thickness, and variability, and the variations in bedrock conductivity. As you can see from the cross section, the example shows the different cover thickness between Delamarine margin and Murray Basin. Therefore, the AEM survey is capable to build the picture of regional geology and support mineral potential assessment in DCD project area. The penetration depth of AEM method is up to 500 meters. To detect deeper conductivity features, we use the MT method to review the lower crust structure, which can be an important control on regional mineralization. Two MT surveys have been done. The Kermana Cube project was led by the University of Adelaide, and the Kermana Cube extension was led by Geoscience Australia. The new MT conductivity 3D model will be released by Wenping for the showcase today. We collected the conductivity data of 10 kilometers, 20 kilometers, and 30 kilometers deep. So these features are too deep to be detected by AEM method. The broad MT picture of the study area is al already known from the Oslam project. What the new survey gives us is better definition and resolution and clearer shallow crustal images. The survey mapped out some exciting variabilities which has not been seen before. As shown by the high resolution 30 kilometer deep model on the right, the new model highlights the different conductivity features, which can be a reflection of the Delamarine arc. Another interesting part is the high conductive domain of the bending room, which extends perpendicular to the arc. We use seismic method to further characterize these transcrustal structures. We collected the seismic reflection data along five seismic lines. Raw data of the seismic survey has been released, and the data processing is ongoing. The processed data will be released before the end of the year. The image on the right is a migrated version of seismic line, which, uh, which is a relatively short one, about 39.5 kilometers. This seismic survey is in the same area of the perpendicular MT anomaly. The preliminary migration shows a dome-shaped structure. We are currently in the process to understand these features. Obviously, there are connections between our data sets, as the seismic data can be integrated with MT data set to better understand the context of the conductive domains, which is useful to understand, understand the crustal architecture and the possible fluid pathways in undercover segments of the Delamarine. The solid geological mapping together with our AEM, seismic, and MT surveys have indicated some favorable transcrustal architecture for mineralization in Delamarine. In order to test the idea, we looked into real rocks and minerals which can tell direct geological and metallogenic information to support regional exploration. Australia has lots of legacy drill cores stored in different states and territories store uh, core libraries. These legacy drill core samples can be hugely valuable for mineral potential assessment. We collected more than 200 legacy samples from multiple prospects for temporal, spatial, metallogenesis, and regional fertility studies. With the result, we aim to gain insights into mineral potentials to support explorers. We viewed thousands of meters legacy drill cores and selected samples for texture, chemistry, and isotope analysis. As an example, the image on the right shows multiple pyrogenic sequences in a thin section scale mineral map based on the cross-cutting relationships and the replacement, replacement textures. There are three pyrogenic sequences and the sulfites are associated with the earliest high temperature albite chloride feldspar alteration. These relative timing relationships are fundamental to target the right manner of specific pyrogenesis to unravel timing, genesis, and fertility. In the next, I'm going to use several examples to show how we crack mineral potential in Delamarine. Magma fertility has been considered to be one of the key factors for the formation of magmatic hydrothermal ore deposits. Thanks to the development of microanalyzed techniques, we can collect multiple data sets from Zircon, including geochronology, trace elements, half room, and oxygen isotopes, which are essential information to assess mag magma fertility. The geochronology indicates multiple stages of magmatism at the Delamarine margin, including the Cambrian and the Silurian events. And the new Zircon, half room, and oxygen isotopes, trace elements data sets collected 
across the delamarine provided key information about variations along and across track and through time. The variations between juvenile and evolved and different redox domains may mean they are fertile for different mineral systems and commodities, might be comparable to the Mercury arc. I'm very glad that it is the most comprehensive dataset by far for big picture fertility studies in Delamarine. No one has done this before, and it is still in progress. Similar to zircon, pyrite, fluorite, and glina are also helpful to unlock mineral potential. The photo on the left shows sulfur isotope compositions of nanoscale pyrite of different textures. The sulfur isotope values of, part, of the parts with clean surface are lower than that of the rough surface. But overall, all the values are between zero and four per mil, which means there are multiple generations of magmatic sulfur involved in the formation of the sulfide. We try to maximize the value of our samples. The sample on the top right is from a fluoride glina vein. We collected samarium, neodymium, and robotium strontium isotopes from the fluoride, and light isotopes from glina. So multiple datasets are collected from this single piece sample. More importantly, the data is consistent with results of other samples by different methods, which means the results are solid and reliable. By using multiple techniques, three magmatic hydrothermal events in the Dalamari margin have been recognized. Traditionally, it is believed that the Dalamari is a Cambrian arc. Apart from the 510 to 495 million years old age, there are also Ordovician and Silurian magmatic hydrothermal events. The samples are from porphyry fertile terrains, so the regional potential for porphyry style mineralization is significantly expanded. The geological, geophysical, geochemical, and mineral system studies provided important information for us to better understand the regional geology framework and the mineral potential. There are some known mineral prospects in the Delamarine margin. The Stively is a Cambrian porphyry copper gold system, and the Anabama is an Ordovician porphyry copper moly system. The Grassmere and Mount Ararite are VHMS systems. The question is, what may be in between? To prove up the geophysical and the geochemical understandings and further refine the regional geological framework and the mineral potential, we completed a drilling campaign to look into the geological and metallogenic framework, which, as mentioned, is fundamental for regional exploration success. Based on magnetic features, we drilled 17 holes in Delamarine margin, including 11 holes by coil tubing technique and 6 holes by diamond rig. The drilling campaign is completed in June 2023. We have done this via collaboration with Minex CRC. Borehole petrophysics, including MECSAS, gamma, and the conductivity data collection is done. My colleague Liam will release the data for this EFTF showcase event, and the details can be found from the provided link. More data will be collected before the end of the year. Another highlight of our drilling campaign is to test the ESG of the city drilling method. Compared to the conventional diamond drilling, the CT technique has been proved to take only 15% water usage, 20% fuel consumption, and five times less carbon footprint. Therefore, the CT drilling has demonstrated great potential for many industries decarbonization in the future. This is a summary and outlook of our project. We have collected a large amount of data, including the new geological, geophysical, geochemical, and geochronological data sites, the stratigraphic drilling program, and sampling and analysis of legacy drill code materials from different prospects. The project is still in progress, and there will be more research code outcomes coming out in the next, including interpretation of new data, enhanced geological framework, and data release of new drilling materials. Currently, a major analytical session for mineral potential assessment is ongoing. We will release the results once available. This is not the end. The story is continuing. We will bring everything together next year. Geoscience Australia is trying to make every effort to unravel the geological framework and metallogenic potential in the Delamarine margin to support exploration success. We have made a sig significant progress over the past few years, and there will be more to come in the next few months. Please stay tuned. If you need any further details, please go to the link provided here. I would like to take this opportunity to thank many of our friends, collaborators, and partner organizations. 
because of limited space, I do apologize as I cannot list them all here. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Yamo. It's exciting to see so many different data sets being acquired and integrated together to better understand the geology and resource potential of the Delamarian margin. So everybody online, thanks for staying with us. This brings us to the question and answer session. We really appreciate the feedback that's been coming through online and the awesome questions. Our presenters are here in the studio ready to answer your questions on their talks. So again, if you've got questions, you've been sitting back, just pop them into the Q&A panel on your screen now um, and include the name of the presenter you'd like to ask the question to. I acknowledge the questions are coming from um, you know, thick and fast right now. So uh, I'm going to start with this one for Yangbo. Um, Yangbo, as you mentioned in your talk, cover has previously been a really significant barrier to exploration across much of Australia. You've been able to effectively image that undercover using geophysics, but validated by drilling. While I know it's still very early in terms of analysis and integration of this new data, do you have a sense of the cover thickness in the Delamarian margin? And do you want to elaborate on how that affects the economic potential of the region? Sure, Marina. Thanks very much for the very interesting question. Uh, I believe uh, many explorers in the Delamarian margin are also quite interested in um, uh, the information about this question. Say, yes, you are right. There are multiple um, scientific methods available to study the depths of uh, covers in undercover terrains. And uh, personally, I believe uh, both drilling and EEM are very effective ways. Say, as you noticed, um, our project is still ongoing. But I think we have collected some very useful information to uh, address this, this question. Say, uh, as I mentioned in, in, in a talk, um, uh, currently Geoscience Australia, Geological Survey of uh, New South Wales, and also the MINEX CRC are collaborating on a drilling campaign in the local class area of the uh, western New South Wales. Um, this is a part of the EFTF TF program, and um, the project, I mean, the, the dream campaign has been completed a few months ago uh, in June uh, this year. So based on the um, dreading, I mean, the data of our dreaming campaign, um, the data has uh, demonstrated that the thickness of the, of the cover in Delamarine margin is between, say, 100 meters to 200 meters. And um, our data also reveals that there is like a layer of, uh, uh, of rocks in the Delamarine and also uh, particularly in the uh, locally cast area. This is consistent with, with what has been uh, discovered in the, um, uh, I mean, on the South Australian side of the, of the border. Similar depths, similar rocks, similar ages, and, and the stratigraphy uh, continues from South Australia to New, New South Wales. Say, apart from our drilling campaign in Lockheed Cars, um, say, the Delamarine um, NDI project run by the Geologic Survey for South Australia and uh, uh, MINAC CRC has also revealed the depths of the um, basement rocks in South Australia is uh, between 170 to 300 meters, but most of the areas, let's say many of the areas, are are within um, 170 and 220 uh, meter steps. Um, say, going further to south, uh, to the stably belt of uh, Western Victoria. Um, um, in 2014, Geoscience Australia conducted a dream campaign in, in, in that part of the world. And the depth in, in Stibley is, is from, from zero to 250 meters because there are a lot of outcrops in, in Stably area. Say, so based on the drilling campaigns and uh, EEM surveys, um, I think the, the basement rocks in, in Delamarine margin are still within explorable depths. Uh, this, well, let's say we have, well, it's really depends on the location and where you want to put your drill holes. But in general, the average depth of, uh, of the cover in Delamarine are uh, around 150 to 200 meters. Say, a relatively shallow um, cover in, in the Delamarine margin means, um, I mean, from the exploration 
exploration perspective, this means um, um, more economic for making discoveries uh, in, in Delamarine uh, for, for, for the regional, regional explorers. Say, in terms of uh, how that impact the economic potential of the region, um, I want to make another point here. Say, by using Geoscience Geos Australia's uh, economic fairways online tool, um, we can estimate the economic uh, potential of the mineral prospects in, in Delamarine. Um, let's take in copper gold in local cars as an example. Uh, say we use uh, 150 meters as the uh, cover thickness and uh, use um, like one percent of copper and one part per million for gold as cutoff grade. So the threshold is around six million. So this means as long as you have six million tons of uh, copper or equivalent, it will be economic. Um, I think it is encouraging because uh, six million tons is not a huge number for copper. So I'm looking forward to see more exploration success in Delamarine in the future. Thanks. Right. Thank you, Yambo. That does sound like it's an, um, a usable uh, depth of cover that we can definitely do exploration in. Um, thank you, Yambo. Um, we've got one for Eloise uh, from Richard Scott. So how much extra eggs database information is there from drilling as opposed to interpretation compared to previously? That's a good question. It's a very good question. Um, so I guess more immediately, the, um, the eggs depth points that we're intending to release before the end of the year, we're expecting to, be ha to have about 1,800 depth points from the DCD area that will uh, be entered into eggs before it will be released on the portal before the end of the year, uh, perhaps two to 400 for Tasmania. Um, but I guess probably the big one that's coming is going to be from the recently released um, Australian borehole compilation um, where we're looking at uh, about 1.8 million stratigraphic picks from around 171,000 boreholes. So, you know, that sort of a long range project is obviously is to try and get all those, those picks into the eggs database. Um, so, you know, this is very much a collaborative effort. Um, obviously, we're collaborating with, with, with groundwater. It's very important, you know, that we're, we're able to leverage off the work that they're doing to, to then populate eggs. Um, but obviously, we're also working very closely with our state partners as well. Um, you know, are able to supply us with their borehole database, um, their databases, but of course we then have to get them eggs ready. It's not a direct import from their databases directly into eggs, so that's a fair amount of work, um, getting, getting that data uh, eggs ready. So um, if, you, uh, if you're interested, you know, if people are interested in having a look at the, um, the Australian uh, borehole compilation that's just been released, um, I urge you to have a look. It's on ECAT and it was also highlighted in the uh, July EFTF newsletter. So yeah, eggs. I mean, look, we're going for national coverage. There are a lot of gaps in the boreholes are obviously a really important data set. Um, you know, we can get, you know, sort of much more sort of concrete lithological information, obviously, from those than we can say from, you know, the, the depth picks from AEM interpretation, for instance, or from, um, you know, the uh, depths to magnetic um, surfaces. But you know, uh, the boreholes are very, very important. So yeah, watch, watch that space. X is getting bigger and better all the time. Thanks, Eloise. I think that's a really good point. That's a, a lot of data. Um, and our EFTF newsletter is a really great way to find out about these data releases. So subscribe today. Um, this one's for Patrice from Cameron Cairns. Uh, are the National Geochemical Grid's only government data or does it incorporate open file industry data? Um, the latter could be a massive resource if it could be brought together and levelled, data wrangling, uh, especially given that many of the company programs have been collected in isolation. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, Cameron. Um, so the, the quick answer is no, but we, in, having said that, we really regard this uh, Geochemical Grids of Australia project to be an evolving one. Uh, so this is the first, the first uh, iteration, the first uh, release, and uh, there, there is hope that over the, few, the forthcoming years that there will be additional data, improved machine learning techniques, and all sorts of other uh, improvements that will make the product better as it, as it matures, so to speak. 
the reason that we didn't do it in the first iteration was that we wanted to prove the concept, so we want a relative degree of simplicity and, and consistency to start with, and uh, importing data from multiple industry databases uh, will be a massive effort because they will probably all be in different uh, formats and we'll need a lot of data wrangling as Marina uh, mentioned. Uh, but it could well worth be, uh, be worth the effort uh, in, the in the medium to long term. And so we'll keep, we'll keep that option open and uh, keep in mind that this is a preliminary product. Thanks Patrice. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, one from Richard Bloyd. Richard. Are there plans for geochemical reanalysis of the rock sample archive as GSWA have done recently from their own NGA's um, collections? Uh, again, uh, no. Uh, there are no plans to reanalyze the rock collections uh, at the moment. Um, the the, the reanalysis or the re, yeah, the reanalysis of the uh, archive samples from BMR and AXO and, and earlier GA. Uh, sample collection was very much uh, again a trial to see if uh, there, there would be value in, in in doing this because it's obviously a lot of a lot of work to prepare the samples and a cost to get them analyzed so um, I think uh, the se uh, stream sediments was the first uh, port of call to, to test that and see what the, what the response is from stakeholder should that response be overwhelming and a cry for more then we could consider potentially reanalyzing some of the rocks to get mainly to get a, a, a larger spectrum of, uh, of elements and yeah, oxides and so on. Thanks, Patrice. Um, Babak, one from Richard Blewett. Excellent talk. I absolutely agree with Richard. Thank you. Can you tell us what efficiency improvements you've achieved with your passive seismic workflow and codes? And are, are the academic community um, using your methods yet? And is industry using them yet, especially for their more local and targeted passive seismic surveying? Thank you, Marina, and thank you, Richard. Yeah. Um, so with efficiency improvements in terms of um, uh, passive seismic workflows, one of the things that uh, we have done was to automate uh, picking of the dispersion curves. Mm -hmm. That's, um, you have to do it, at least if, even if you don't do that manually, um, the quality control is usually done manually, but we have automated both procedures, so the picking and the quality control are done automatically, and um, the results that we're getting is that it's, it's quite convincing, because I don't know, I personally don't believe too much in automation. <laughs> so I usually, if there is an automation, I would like to test it against something that is already well established. And so I, I have confidence in that this is, this is working. Um, in terms of how efficient it, it, ha it is, you can think of, I don't know, if a person picks uh, 1,000 dispersion curves a week, then um, yeah, my code picked 15,000 dispersion curves in five minutes. So it's, yeah, it's orders of magnitude uh, it's faster. Efficient. <laughs> it's efficient. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it is efficient, I think. Um, it, um, the other part of the question about uh, would it the uh, academic community, yes, I know that they are using oh. it. Um, we are getting citations on the paper that you wrote about it. Mm, I'm not sure if the industry is still using it. I think we have to be more active on that front to introduce the code. Um, the code for um, the automation of the picking dispersion curve is not pop is not out there yet. It's a messy code. Everything needs to be um, cleaned up and do well documented, and it will be done. It, that will be done by the end of um, the program year two. Yeah. yeah, six or eight months. Bear back, not yeah. long now. Um, and Richard again. Um, no need to apologise. Bear back. Have you uh, taken a well understood domain? and where we know the velocity, uh, for example, wide angle seismic and or refraction data, and linked it to the active seismic and the gravity with your passive seismic model to back out rock density and its distribution. If this works, can you can roll it out wherever you have passive seismic data with fuel constraints. You would therefore have a way of improving our understanding of gravity field, especially in the big regional anomalies in terms of rocks. That is a great question. It's a great question, yeah. <laughs> it's a very great question. Um, so, yes, we have done some work in that regard. So what we did was, so one of the things that I didn't show is that um, in, in the talk was the receiver function work that we have done, which images MOHO. 
So uh, we have a we have a uh, we are very confident in the image of the Moho that we are creating with under the Azure to um, 50 by 50 kilometer in Northern Territory, and what we have done what we did there was to use that Moho image and inspired by the velocities that we are getting from ambient noise tomography, um, generate a density model that represents the gravity data, and Alexei has been working on that. So yes, we are working on that, um, but. I don't have a, like a conclusive image to talk about at no, the moment. Not yet. But yes, not yet. Yeah, not yeah, yet. Yeah, <laughs> hang tight. Um, Yangbo uh, from Mr. or Mrs. Anonymous. Uh, Yangbo, is there any evidence for a 440 million year event in Northern Delamarian? Thank you very much for the question. <laughs> it's, um, to be honest, I also want to know the answer of this question. Um, say, uh, for the northern of uh, the Lamarine, uh, I assume you mean uh, the north of uh, Cunumbury Belt of uh, New South Wales. Uh, there are some different um, assumptions on the geological evolu evolution history in that part of the world. Say, um, for the, for the or organic gold systems in the Tibobara region, there are different understandings about in terms of the timing. Um, one of the ideas um, is that the Gold mineral systems in, in that part of the world formed at around 400 million, 440 million years old, which is similar to the uh, gold mineral in, um, um, in Bendigo in uh, uh, Victoria. So, uh, so in that case, um, that can give us a bit more specific information about the uh, tectonic evolution and also the uh, metal genesis uh, of the gold mineral in, in, and also the relationship between the uh, gold mineration in, in the two areas. That, that's one of the assumptions. And another hypothesis um, is um, actually it's, um, it's much older than, than 440. Uh, it's post the Delamarine, around 490, 480 million years old. Um, so currently, we, I haven't got any direct uh, evidence to test uh, this uh, hypothesis, but these, these kind of jobs are on my, uh, on my list, actually on the top of my list. We have collected, um, uh, uh, we have checked um, like thousands of meters drill holes in different parts of Delamarine, in including the northern side of uh, Delamarine. And also we collect hundreds of samples um, to, uh, for, for different analyses. And geochronology is one of the key part of the analytical session. Um, we will find it, find it out. And um, uh, I think by the end of the year, we are going to receive uh, a lot more data sets from different labs in Australia and also from international uh, laboratories. Uh, by then, I will have more evidence to say um, if we have a uh, 440 million years old event um, in, in the northern of Delamarine or not. But currently, I don't have any direct evidence yet. Yet. We'll stay tuned for that one. Good question. Okay. Um, for any of the speakers, or for me, mm -hmm. definitely not for me. Uh, Officer Basin for EFTF3. Would anybody like to take that? I can take that if you like. I'll take it. <laughs> I have a feeling I know who Anonymous might be. Uh, as a part of the current program, we did look at the Officer Basin. We looked at reprocess legacy reflection seismic. Uh, we looked at legacy drill holes. Um, we improved the stratigraphic correlation. Um, and it's certainly a huge frontier region which would benefit from more, you know, research, investigation, data acquisition, and um, it, perhaps it could be a focus for future work. And thank you for the prompt. Okay, this one's for Babak. Uh, Osare is an ambitious, and I'm going to, it is a very <laughs> ambitious national data acquisition program, not only because of the logistics of the deployment, so many stations across the whole country, but also processing and interpreting a large volumes of data generated from these stations. Your new dispersion curve picking approach goes a long way to um, automating the workflow. What further in innovations are required to collect and or unlock the full potential of this Osiray data? The full potential of Os. <laughs> well, that's a great question. I think, um, well, I don't want to be too dramatic, but I think um, the ambient noise tomography that I showed is, could be just the tip of the iceberg yeah. of the full potential of continuous recording of seismic data, 
you can think of, well, it's recording ambient noise, but it's also recording large earthquakes that play boundaries. That's another signal that one can use. It's also recording tiny, tiny earthquakes beneath our feet here in Australia. It's also um, recording the anthropogenic noise, um, uh, like stations near cities are usually near cities or um, mines are usually m noisier. There are more signals in there. Actually, there was a study in science uh, two years ago that they realized that um, uh, stations have recorded that our cities are calmer during the COVID lockdown. <laughs> so, um, and also you even, you can even um, think of just last week on Monday, people in the Melbourne were reporting that they saw a, um, a, a meteor. Uh, they, I've seen videotapes and videos on that um, on social media. And at, right after that, they um, reported they felt an earthquake. Uh, but we now know that that was debris from a rocket which was launched to, which launched a satellite in the Earth orbit. And what we saw there was the um, debris of that rocket coming in, um, and that created a sonic boom, which actually our station picked up. So it's a range of things that are being recorded by uh, 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 any di uh, seismic deploy, any continuous seismic deployment. So I, I guess the challenge in there now, we, we're going to, we have a lot of data. We were going to, you're going to require even more data. Um, so the challenge there is how to um, label these events in our seismic data. We can't do this manually. We shouldn't do this manually. There's too much data to go through. So I guess in that front, on that front, um, we should be benefiting from the, we live in the AI and machine learning hype. So we should be benefiting from those um, uh, screening tools that machine learning has provided for us where um, we, we there's one uh, there are a few applications that I've seen where there are machine learning models that go through your data and detect small tiny little earthquakes um, that otherwise um, permanent networks like our, our own won't pick up because they are designed they're scattered and they're designed to detect only larger earthquakes. Mm -hmm. So, and then, uh, well, one could say, well, that's just imaging the seismicity, but you can use those tiny little earthquakes, uh, the body wave, the, the seismic signal that you record from those tiny earthquakes to image the structure. Mm -hmm. So the images that I showed today was purely using surface wave arrivals, excited by ambient noise, to ambient background ambient noise, but you could use small earthquakes under the deployment to, to increase the resolution. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, and combining that with surface wave data, that would just be amazing. So, yeah, I, I think that's where we should be moving towards. I agree, <laughs> and I think it is the top of the tip of the iceberg, but there is like and loads of data. Um, Babak from Karen, um, Karen Connors. Hi, Karen. Um, Karen's interested in the comparison of velocity you showed to 17GA-SN2. Uh, which is the deep crust floor ref, um, reflection seismic line. How accurate is the depth of the velocity model? And have you published this image or is your presentation available? I'll let you answer those. Um, no, this is not uh, published yet, but there will be a publication on this. How accurate is the depth of the velocity model um, in the active seismic or in the passive seismic? I'm oh, guessing both. Let's in go both. both. <laughs> well, <laughs> in both, um, with the top um, 10, 15 kilometer, I'm quite mm. confident in the yeah. passive seismic yeah. uh, velocities. Same goes, not maybe not 15 kilometer, but five top five kilometer images in the active seismic are also, Absolutely. we could be quite confident yeah. in those velocities. So when we compare those and they match so nicely, that's, that is a sign that uh, yeah, a job is done. Yeah, well. totally yeah. agree. And all the presentations will be available online uh, from the EFTF showcase page, um, but also email um, EFTF at ga.gov.au um, if you've got any questions because we'll be able to point you in the right direction. Um, also subscribe to the newsletter. Um, this one's for LLEs. Um, it's really exciting to see the machine learning being applied to generate national conductivity models for the top four metres. Um, what potential is there to apply machine learning or AI to accelerate traditional geological interpretation and mapping, without getting it too wrong, uh, like interpreting conductivity sections, making cover to thickness maps, and interpreting solar geology? Oh, there's huge potential. I mean, there's huge potential, isn't there? Yeah. I mean, you know, in an ideal world, you know, we'd have the ultimate geological map where we actually had, you know, information for every spot yeah. on the continent. Yeah. Well, we don't. I mean, yeah. we're not even close to yeah. that. And it's a particular problem, obviously, with Australia because we're big 
and you know <laughs> um, so so yeah so there's huge huge potential um, I mean we're already applying machine learning in, in all sorts of ways already um, so for instance there was the unpredictive um, grids for the major oxide um, concentrations that was released recently so you know we're already using machine learning to try and extrapolate away from the, the data we do have to fill in those to fill in those gaps um, so you know it's obviously it's hugely important that you know it can be applied in many ways I mean for instance you know we have a dream maybe of redoing the surface geology yeah. map of Australia now yeah trying to do that in a more in in a traditional way you know in the way that the first edition was done where we're do, building compilations from existing data sets it makes much more sense to try and use machine learning um, to try and and you know build build you know a second edition you know um, the British Geological Survey is actually already doing a very similar sort of thing um, using machine learning for their mapping obviously much smaller country than Australia yep. But you know, they're, what they're doing is that they're, they're using a, a properties first approach rather than a classification first approach. So they're taking the property of interest and then they're able to use machine learning to actually you know, build, build their maps. And then the classification can come later. And you know, the good thing about the properties first approach is that it, it sort of um, helps with the issue you run into where you're using traditional data sets which are collected by different people at different times using different standards um, and that can cause all sorts yeah. of issues when you're trying to build compilations and believe me we know this you know doing through the solid geology so using a machine learning approach you're taking away some of that uncertainty you know and, and you're able to build something that's much more standardized yeah. Um, so yeah I, mean, I think there's going to be lots of exciting stuff going on in, in, in that space I agree mm. Does, would anybody else like to weigh in on the machine learning AI aspect National coverages. I agree. And, uh, as, as we showed the geochemical grids, we're, we're starting to do that with surface geochemistry, and it could be expanded to drill hole geochemistry as well in the future. And uh, it's certainly going to go ahead in leaps and bounds, I'm sure, over the next decade or so. Yeah. And there are some um, um, exploration comp companies are also using machine learning and, and AI. Uh, to support uh, their exploration activities in different parts of the world, and um, um, they have made some exploration success already. So, it, I think it's, the future is quite bright. Excellent. Mm. Thank you. Uh, one for Richard Blewett. What are the benefits of Osiray research for GA's other work in hazards, uh, shape maps as products, for example, workflow sharing as organisational efficiency? I'll hand over to you first, Baba. That's a great question, Richard. Um, so we do have a, our um, national network that is recording, continuously recording and monitoring nearest grids. Um, but what's uh, one of the limitations of our national network is that it's quite sparse. Um, it's designed to um, report major earthquakes. That's what it's designed for. But what Azure gives us uh, is the ability to, is the opportunity to um, look for tiny little small earthquakes which better maps the seismicity. So any improvement on the seismicity will go back to the, um, I don't know, shape maps, seismic hazards, and other products that yeah. we're, we're pr producing here at GA. Yeah, and yeah. it'll have um, impacts on um, mapping basins and groundwater and movement of potentially fluids and gases. There's, the door is open now, and, and with the amount of data and the, and the improved um, technology and uh, deployment methods, the coding, uh, it, it, the opportunities are, are really endless there. But yeah, great. Thanks, Richard. Patrice, the data sets you showed are extensive and you began to show some new insights arising from the work and various applications. I know this is like asking you to pick your favourite child, but out of the vast array of new data sets, what gets you most excited and what do you think will have the greatest impact on exploration and natural resource management? Thanks, Marina. Well, that's a deep and meaningful question. Uh, look, I, I think, I think the, uh, the exciting thing about uh, this uh, project of uh, adding value to the uh, archive collection of samples is, is really the diversity of things that we are now adding. So I think that in itself, the fact that we, we have you know, three isotopic systems, we have two types of mineralogical maps, uh, all this is adding new dimensions, and uh, especially when you start looking at things at the continental scales. So not all of these new data sets are continental yet, 
Uh, but I would have to say that the most comprehensive project is, is the HMMA, the Heavy Mineral Map of Australia. I mean, that is, that is a massive project, uh, reanalyzing the whole country's uh, archive collection for heavy, mi heavy minerals. Um, so we are, we are collecting uh, up to 10,000, well, tens of thousands of uh, mineral identifications per sample. So we're going to end up with a, with a massive data set, uh, millions of data points. And uh, that, that really is, I think, is very exciting and uh, it, it being such a big project with such a potential and, uh, for uh, applications in, in, a, in a range of uh, fields in the future. I think that's, that, that is really exciting. That, that gets me up in the morning now. <laughs> Excellent. No, I, I absolutely agree. Thanks, Patrice. Unfortunately, we'll have to draw the question and answer session to a close here. Um, thank you, Ambo, Babak, Eloise and Patrice. And thank you everyone who attended today's session. And if you'd still like to ask a question, definitely email us or ring us if you know who we are. Um, our email is eftf at ga.gov.au. And, and just a reminder, all the talks, our new products that released today and over the showcase can be ac accessed through our showcase webpage, which is ga.gov.au slash showcase. Thanks, everyone. The, the showcast will continue tomorrow morning, uh, just tomorrow afternoon, 12.30 p.m. with a session on geological processes and, and resources. If you're not registered for that session, it's not too late. You can still register using the link on the showcase webpage. We hope to see you all again tomorrow. 